physics and math um, and and don't see any reason. And there he is. Oh my God, you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Because I'm not ready. I'm kidding. I'm totally ready. Let me join the audio. He can probably hear me now. Hey there. Hi. Right, wait, hold on. I'll let you groom real quick so no one can see you yet. So so I just just because it's I know this has been a confusing thing. So you have my stream muted, right? I do. I see you. Your screen is muted. So I see you pointing your finger right now. <laughs> I'm pointing at you over on this other monitor and no one sees like my hand gets cut off. It goes into space. <laughs> That's awesome. There's also a nice time delay between when I hear you and when I see you. So I get to see you talking uh, at a totally different time when I get to hear you speaking. And I bet you can find a way to work that in with astronomy. Oh, I'm sure, you know, you know it's got to go to space and it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, you guys ready? Everybody buckle in. Here is an astrophysicist, theoretical physicist, and he also has a bunch of other really cool stuff that he can tell us about. Here's his beautiful face. See? See this magnificent face right here? <laughs> and, that, and that beard and mustache has won awards. It has won awards, but I'll tell you, I'll fess up, it never won first place. My best showing was in 2012. I competed in the West Coast Beard and Mustache Championships. My category had 17 people, and I finished second. The guy who won, you may recognize as having an enormous mustache. He's a professional barber, and he's appeared on Portlandia for his mustache. So oh, good beard and mustache. But I try not to be competitive about it. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to be competitive. Yeah, and everybody's like, oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. So this is this, but this is what I love about science. And and I and, and everybody, theoretical beard assist. That's right. Thank you, Undead Banana. <laughs> so he can read chat, guys. So tell us more That's about right. yourself. That's right. This, isn't it oh, isn't it an amazing world we live in? It is. It be is. an astrophysicist. Grow epic beard and mustache, read chat windows, profit. This has gotta, this has gotta be, gotta be the plan. This is it, guys. This is this is how this happens. Oh man. So I'm I'm enjoying just already, already. I knew this. When I saw you know, because I already knew about you, but when I went to your Twitter, I was I was like, okay, this person's perfect. This is wonderful. Oh no, because you have seen years of my Twitter avatar. Every new year, I replace my old Twitter avatar with my last year's Halloween costume. So on Halloween, <laughs> you get a new one every year. And so people who've been following me for a while have seen me. I'm currently Queen Elsa from Frozen, and I have been King Triton from The Little Mermaid. I have been Axe Cop from Axe Cop. I have been Zangi from Street Fighter 2. I've been like you, you're in for a good time if you like fun costumes. In fact, for those of you up in Seattle, this weekend, starting tomorrow, I'll be uh, a science guest at, at Norwest Con, a uh, big science fiction fantasy writers convention. And uh, yeah, I'll be up there uh, having a good time. <laughs> Oh, nice. On screen. That is me. And that's you can Elsa. see in the background, that's also my cover photo is me dressed as Rainbow Dash from oh, yeah. My Little Pony. <laughs> Guys, this is astrophysics at its finest. I love it. I seriously oh, love yeah. it. I do. Yeah. I do. Because <laughs> I think people, when they see just, you know, just headshots that aren't fun, <laughs> I think it's <laughs> everybody... Oh gosh, it's so good. It's so good. And yeah, so he, he has You bring up a key point. Yeah. Everyone out there, make sure you have a fun head. Fun head. If your head's not fun, no one's gonna have a good time on Twitter. Right, because look at how, how limited he is right now, even just in my, my own screen. Fun I head. I know, I know. You can't see how well the beard forks into two pieces. You can't see <laughs> that my mustache has grown its own mustache. <laughs> Things happen. <laughs> it's great guys and 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 now and now you can start answering if, if you don't mind all the questions that I keep saying we don't know we don't you know, know there's I remember when I was in college my math teacher for differential equations was trying to teach us the importance of solving things that were really hard and he said to us on the very first day 
he looked at us and he said, most differential equations cannot be solved. So, you know, try to diffuse our arrogance that we were going to solve all the equations out there. No, most of them can't be solved. And his second sentence was, most of the differential equations that can be solved cannot be solved by you. And I thought, you know, this is a good introduction to humbling. Most of the things that we can ask about the universe, we don't know. But most of the things that we do know about the universe, uh, most of us don't know. So I will answer the best questions I can to the best of my ability, but no better. When we get to the limits of my knowledge or the limits of everyone knowledge, I'm going to let you know. We're not going to pretend we know things that we don't. Yes. So I'll go ahead and uh, can I just like, I'm going to just ask for everybody else because I've been asked these things like all week. And I live stream. Unload it. Okay. You know, you're, you, you look you look like you're, you're good to go. Let's go. Let's Show go. me what you got. Okay. So first, the, we'll start with the newest of news, which was released yesterday about that galaxy that appears to not have as much dark matter as originally thought. Yeah. You already wrote about that. What do you want to know about it? Everything? Yes. Okay, let's tell you everything. So, dark matter, universe, right? Universe gets created. It's awesome. It's also super uniform. So, we have filling up the universe. Matter, antimatter, radiation, dark energy, energy inherent to space itself, and dark matter. In the early stages, things are smashing together all the time. You spontaneously create particle-antiparticle pairs, and you spontaneously annihilate away particle-antiparticle pairs back into photons, radiation, everything that you can make that you have enough energy for, you create. Then the universe cools, and all of a sudden, your particle-antiparticle pairs, when they hit, they annihilate. But when you have radiation and radiation colliding, you don't have enough energy to make the new particles anymore. So somehow, we don't know how this happened, somehow when all these particle-antiparticle pairs annihilated away, for every about 1.4 billion antiparticles, there was about 1.4 and 1 oh. billion. So 1.4 billion plus 1 particles. And that's why we have matter and not antimatter left over in the universe. Well, somehow we also created dark matter. Dark matter is just like normal matter from the perspective of gravity. It exerts a gravitational force, it curves the fabric of space, and it leads to the formation of stars, galaxies, the large scale structure of the universe, etc. But what dark matter doesn't do is it doesn't collide with itself like normal matter collides with itself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't block light and it doesn't emit light. So it doesn't have the electromagnetic or nuclear interactions that normal matter does. It means when two dark matter particles collide, they pass right through each other. So that said, that's what dark matter is. Normally, when you form galaxies, the dark matter gravitationally collapses and it provides a place for the normal matter to collect. The dark matter, because it doesn't collapse, it doesn't interact with itself, it doesn't have friction, it doesn't lose energy, it doesn't emit light, it just remains in this big, fluffy, diffuse halo. But the normal matter, you know, imagine it starts out shaped in some weird shape. Uh, mathematicians call it a triaxial ellipsoid. That's a little complicated, so I'd just like you to envision a potato. Okay. Right, just potato-shaped object. Got it, object. potato. This is how things start off. You have a long axis, you have a second longest axis, and then you have a shortest axis. And things collapse along the shortest axis first, bam. And then everything else rotates. That's how you make a disk. That's how you make a nice disk galaxy. And that's what normally happens. Most of the galaxies we see out there seem to have this, that they have all the normal matter we see. And then as you go farther and farther out, you see the gravitational effects of dark matter. You start to see, well, we don't see any extra, like, normal matter. We don't see the signatures of gas or x-rays or, or light coming from it or anything being blocked, but we see the gravitational effects and they're more and more pronounced the farther out you go. So there's got to be something else there. We just found for the first time a galaxy that looks like it has a whole bunch of normal matter and virtually no dark matter. 
Mm -hmm. It's about the mass of the Milky Way. So this is pretty, pretty much a big deal. Yeah. And then you say, okay, well, look, what's going on? If you have all of this matter without dark matter, how does that happen? Because you can, if I had a galaxy with both normal matter and dark matter, and I did something like I made a bunch of stars or a bunch of supernovae or a bunch of explosions, I can expel normal matter out of the galaxy, but I can't get the dark matter out. The normal matter interacts with light, with radiation, with other normal matter. Right. So if I get the right conditions, I can expel normal matter. But how am I going to expel the dark matter? Hmm. So that's the big question is how do we get a galaxy that has normal matter but doesn't have dark matter? Well, I know if you've been reading the news, it's like, oh, it's a big mystery. And yeah, it's a big mystery because this is the first time we found it and we don't know how, how it came to be this way. But we have really good ideas. In fact, I'll say personally, I like four of them. There are four really good ideas that I like out there. The first one is something that we see. If you have a big galaxy cluster, mm -hmm. Right. You have a lot. You have what we call an intercluster medium. You know, if you went and traveled through space, empty space is pretty empty, but it's not totally empty. If you were to travel really fast through empty space between the stars, you'd collide with particles, antiparticles, ions, radiation all the time. Well, in a galaxy cluster. Right. Our local group has us, Andromeda, Triangulum, and like 60 rinky-dink galaxies. Mm -hmm. you know, apologies to anyone listening in one of them loser galaxies out there, <laughs> but you guys are real insignificant. Yeah, we're not going to um, talk about the small Magellanic cloud, but you, go on. <laughs> no, but in a galaxy cluster, you can get thousands of Milky Way-sized galaxies, and there is a huge intercluster medium between there. So what happens is when you get a galaxy, if it goes fast enough through that intercluster medium, you can see all that gas gets stripped out. And in fact, we've seen from telescopes like Hubble, trails of stars mm -hmm. getting stripped out of galaxies as gas clouds get stripped out of galaxies and boom, 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 they form little dots and lines of stars. So it's possible that if you have a galaxy speeding through a cluster, gas is getting stripped out of it, which means this galaxy has its normal matter, its dark matter halo, but some of the normal matter is getting left behind. Hmm. And that could form a galaxy with no dark matter in it. You can also have what I'll call an unbound splat. What if I had a big galaxy and a big galaxy and they collided with each other but didn't merge? They were moving so fast that they collided and went apart. And one, the one that came this way left with its dark matter and most of its stars intact. The one that came this way left with most matter and, dark, and stars intact. But what happened in the middle? They collided, there was a splat, and in the middle, bam, you would have a whole bunch of stars with no dark matter in there. So that's a second way you can make a galaxy without dark matter. Third way, this was uh, this was actually the oldest idea I know. This was put forth 20 years ago by Priya Natarajan. And she said with her collaborators, well, what if, you know, you take a look at these quasars we have. These are ultra massive galaxies with active black holes and they have huge outflows. What happens to that outflowing matter? It's all normal matter. What happens if it gets ejected far away from the galaxy? Well, over enough time, and the universe has been around for billions and billions of years, so over enough time, what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna have these ejected matter particles slow down gravitationally collapse, and maybe they can form stars. Wouldn't that be a great way to make a galaxy? And finally, do you remember a few years ago, there were these green glowing objects found around galaxies? Uh, the first one was found by, uh, I believe her name was Hanny Van Arkel, a citizen scientist from the Netherlands, and they called this Hanny's Vorwerp. No, well, I don't. Well, you'll look up Hanny's Vorwerp. Now I will. Maybe someone in the background will get a picture for us of Hanny's Vorwerp. Um, 
And these are spectacular glowing green objects. The green we now know comes from oxygen lines. That's doubly ionized oxygen at temperatures more than about 50,000 Kelvin. But if you have these big clouds of gas that came about from some cataclysmic event, what's gonna happen over time? Well, presumably they're gonna collapse down and form stars and there you go, a new galaxy, but with no dark matter in it. So when we say, yeah, this is mysterious, it is. This is the first one of a new class of rare objects that we found. Is this a problem for dark matter? It's the opposite. It's a problem for models that don't have dark matter. If you have dark matter and normal matter mixed together, you would expect that it would be possible to have normal matter separated from dark matter or dark matter separated from normal matter. But it wouldn't be possible if there were no dark matter to have a galaxy full of stars that acts like it has dark matter and a very similar galaxy full of stars that acts like it has no dark matter. So this is a puzzle for astrophysics, but it's a problem for the camp that doesn't want dark matter. It's not a problem for the camp that says we think the universe is full of dark matter. Interesting. Everybody's every, uh, yeah, just trying to understand. So, yeah, if you hopped in the middle of that, that's going to seem a little difficult. But uh, and, and guys, again, he's a theoretical physicist. So, I mean, he's astrophysics. Yeah, he went and, and studied that. And then that's that became. Is there any part of theoretical physicists like that or physics that you really enjoy? Because <laughs> I know that even theoretical, there's so many things I can think. I've been asked so many theoretical questions. Like well, is theoretical questions for me basically say, okay, look, in terms of astronomy, astrophysics, there's four different types of astronomers or astrophysicists out there. There are the classic kind, the observers, the mm -hmm. observational astronomers. This is what you think of, of looking through a telescope, viewing the universe, getting your data, that's it, you're an astronomer, you're looking at what's up in the skies. That's still around. They don't use their eyes as much. They use CCDs and photographic plates and you know much more modern technology. Um, the second type, also just as old as astronomy itself, instrument builders, people who build telescopes, mirrors, cameras, lenses, all of this. This is an essential part of astronomy. You need people to use the instruments and you need people to build the instruments. There's the third type, which is me. This is the theorist. This is saying, okay, all that stuff we see out there, what's going on? How did it get to be that way? What, is, what are its properties today? And how is it going to evolve in the future? The theoretical astrophysicist part of, of this equation is basically saying, how can we explain physically everything that we see in the universe? How did it form? How does it work? and what's going to happen to it in the future. And finally, there's the fourth type, this is pretty new. These are people who do data analysis. These are people who do computational astrophysics. And I don't just mean doing big simulations, I mean taking huge amounts of data and applying modern computer science techniques like artificial intelligence, big data processing, et cetera, to look like to look at say, okay, what information can we use as a computer to extract that a human mind or human eyes would not be able to pull out? Right, right, and everybody is, oh, wait, yeah. Uh, it's okay, everyone's just commenting on my facial hair, it's, it's fine. okay, how, well, yeah, so how rare do you think this type of galaxy is? Uh, because if it's very rare, woof. Uh, maybe we are, we're not the only sentient species to be, okay, right? And if we can't find each other directly, maybe we can meet while studying. Yeah. So, so how, how rare are these? Do you, do you speculate? Well, we've seen, we've literally surveyed millions and millions of galaxies, and this is the first one we found without dark matter. So that tells us at the very least that galaxies like this are rare, at least this massive and bright. It's rare to have, like this galaxy that we found, this oddball, it's about as massive as the Milky Way is. So that's a rarity. It's a rarity to have a galaxy this massive with no dark matter in it. But it may be very common to have a galaxy 
that's much smaller than us that doesn't have dark matter in it. Um, we've only started to find the very lowest mass galaxies over the last couple of decades, and we found them around our own Milky Way. If you look up a galaxy like Segway 1 or Segway 3, S-E-G-U-E, -E, you will find that these galaxies have about 600,000 solar masses mm -hmm. worth of matter in them, but only about 1,000 stars maybe even only a few hundred stars. They're mostly dark matter, and there's hardly any normal matter in them. The reason we think this happened is when you form a much smaller clump of mass in the universe, a much lower mass galaxy, the, you get the big dark matter halo, and you get a cloud of gas which collapses, forms stars. When you form massive stars, though, this ultraviolet radiation that they produce boils off the rest of the matter. And if the gravitational potential well that you have from your normal matter and dark matter combined isn't big enough, then this gas is gonna get expelled entirely. So, but the dark matter doesn't respond to that radiation, it stays put. So that's how we think the counterpoint of that happens. And we have these ultra low mass galaxies that we find all over the place that only have tiny amounts of normal matter, but enormous amounts of dark matter. Mm -hmm. We could have the converse of that because this gas that gets expelled, if that finds itself and collapses down and forms new stars, we're gonna have a bunch of low mass objects out there in the universe that are all normal matter and no dark matter. That could be very common. Yeah, uh, and what's, can you, okay. That, that follows up with this. Uh, we need to have Mr. Siegel on more often. Doctor, yeah, uh, so he can, he's got his PhD. I do have a PhD. <laughs> I am a real doctor of astrophysics. I, I graduated from University of Florida in 2006. Um, I've worked as a research scientist uh, at the University of Arizona. I've been a professor at University of Portland and Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I assure you that I, I actually have, uh, I actually have the chops at this. Yeah, everybody's saying you need to be on more often, and that's the thing. Like these people, uh, you know, this is this is why we're doing this. So they know that they can come on here and they can see a lot of people actually here on Twitch, which are a lot, and Twitch is growing. Um, <laughs> but can you play Fortnite? Do you play video games? <laughs> <laughs> I do play some video games, but I'm an old school gamer. I I I I play a lot of the classics. Yeah. In fact, I've got a uh, if I if I move around a little bit here, you might see I've got a little controller here on my desk. <gasps> An SNES controller. You recognize controller. this? This mm -hmm. is a Super Nintendo Classic controller. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the kind of gaming I do. I'm not a big fan of massive online multiplayer games, which I, I'm sorry, guys. But uh, that Super Nintendo Classic for me was a reward for me for finishing this book. When I finished writing this book, we said, I need a reward for this. Super Nintendo Classic was my reward. Can I see the book again, though? I think a lot of people in here are Star Trek fans, so... Oh, yeah. You want to talk about this a little bit? Yes, please. Okay, so this book is called Treknology, and it is about the real-life science of all the technologies that were featured in Star Trek, not including Star Trek Discovery, because the book was finished about eight months before Discovery premiered. Wait, hold but it up, hold it up again. I'm sorry to interrupt you. different technologies from the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise, as well as all the movies, so you get artificial gravity in there, um, that were featured in Star Trek. And what we did was we took a look and said, okay, Star Trek envisioned these ultra futuristic technologies that would come and change our lives. And it started doing this back in 1966. It started doing this 52 years ago now. Star Trek The Next Generation was 21 years after that. 1987 was when it premiered. In that time, a huge number of these technologies have actually come to fruition. In many cases, like in the case of a smartphone, they've even exceeded what Star Trek may have envisioned 
for hundreds of years into the future. So for every technology that you can imagine, we talk about what did Star Trek envision? What's the real life science behind them? What's the status of them today? And what are, what are our hopes and fears and some ethical questions surrounding them moving forward into the future? So you will have everything from warp drive to transporters to isolinear chips and hyposprays to tricorders, to replicators, any technology that you can imagine, well, up to the 28 that are in the book, are featured in the book. Yeah, and that's, I, 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 I asked, like, because it, it cut you off, but I showed it on screen, the artwork. Oh, wait, yeah, wait, wait, wait. I'll show wait. it again. Yeah, hold on. Let me, let me center you completely. So put it, center in, put, me it put it, yeah, put it, there you go. You don't need to see my face. Right? <laughs> the people are just like Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. And the best part that I think anyone will love is this book is hardcover. <laughs> I know it's on sale at a super good price at Amazon right now. And if you look inside, it is gorgeous. We have over 150 images in there from all the different series in Star Trek. So you want to know how an automatic sliding door works? There's Ensign Rose slant standing against one that doesn't work. You want to know what it's like if you, uh, you know, want to say uh, clone somebody or make an, a hologram of a person? We've got technologies about that. You want to know about phasers, guess what? The military actually has developed something that works just like a phaser does, where you can knock someone out, you can give someone a concussive blast without any danger of lethal force used. Imagine that you can do that. Imagine what it's like for up to two kilometers away if you could say, I'm going to phaser blast that person. What they do is they send a two-phase pulse, little preview of the book here. Two-phase pulse, first pulse is ultraviolet light. It creates a little bit of ionized plasma on you just knocking electrons off of atoms and molecules, just a little bit of ionized plasma on the target. Second phase pulse, infrared radiation, just heat if you touch it normally, but if it hits an ionized plasma, that plasma is gonna absorb all of that energy. So you send a high intensity infrared pulse at this ionized plasma and it makes the plasma rapidly expand. What does a rapidly expanding plasma do? It acts like a concussive blast and it will knock a target off their feet, disabling them and maybe even knocking them out. Imagine how this could revolutionize law enforcement. <laughs> if all of a sudden you can do this to a target and you don't have the risk of using lethal force, that you can do it at such a great distance up to two kilometers that you don't even have to put your own life in danger to get there. I think it's a pretty good deal. I'd like to see it happen. Oh my God, my chat. I don't think I've seen my chat get this excited. Uh, this is amazing. Everybody's like, this guy is my, uh, this dude is my idol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he can talk. So, so, okay, so I, I guess- I was a fan. I grew up on Star Trek The Next Generation. So that was my, that was my jam when I was a kid. And uh, I read the original physics of Star Trek when I was in high school. And I thought that, you know, it was this combination of this brilliant futuristic uh, dream of what society could be if we used what we've learned about science and technology for the benefit of all humanity. At the same time, it helped us wrestle with these ethical questions about the problems, problems we had, had in modern, modern society, society through, through the science fiction, fiction lens. lens. I loved about Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation, Generation in particular, that it wasn't, wasn't afraid, afraid to explore, even hundreds of years in the future, even when technology has solved a huge number of problems, we still need to struggle with what's right and wrong, who suffers, who wins, who benefits, and what's the right thing to do in these difficult circumstances. Someone's saying that we have echo. I don't know. I don't, I don't hear any echo. I don't hear any but, echo. Uh, but if they hear it, uh, they say they it could be, it could, could be like, like they're saying, it could just be space voice. voice. Let, let, me, let, me, let me try, try to make space voice. Reverb <laughs> mode activated. Wait, I don't understand. I don't know what configuration changed. I didn't touch anything. Uh, 
I hear echo. What do you hear echo? Oh, Ethan, your voice is echoing. Why? My voice is echoing. Is it just me? Yeah, I'm not hearing anything on my end. Just your voice, yeah. Hmm. Well, let me try closing the chat window and see if that does anything. Not anymore. They said no, it's fixed. Oh. So that's well, that's I actually didn't delayed. Touch anything, yeah. So uh it fixed itself. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, quantum possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. And you went with it. That was, oh my goodness. That was great. But I have to, I have to get, I have to ask, by the way, we aren't trolling. Yeah, no, I can tell if, if everybody's saying it like that. Yeah, no, I can tell. I can tell. Um, I think, I think Captain Casual got it that uh, I leaked the military secrets <laughs> of phaser technology. And that was, that was someone coming in to put the kibosh on that. <laughs> Oh man, but you handled that well. Very, very, that was great. That was awesome. Um, we heard him from different dimensions. Oh, speaking of which, so yeah. I know that warp drive, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a Trekkie. Um, oh, I know, I know. Well, well if we want to have Don't questions about it, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to let the chat window. Yeah, go. we'll have but, to defer uh, to them. But, but not being a Trekkie, um, you know, I guess we'll say, uh, you'll have to take advantage of the opportunity you have right now to uh, see if you can be convinced. Convinced by my chat? My chat's been trying to convince me for forever to sit down and watch TV shows. I have a really hard time doing, I just don't have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, time's a problem. <laughs> time's but, a real uh, problem. But, sometimes but it's drive, worth it. But warp drive, I know warp drive just because my chat asks me like every five seconds. Well, this last yeah. week. Of course they do. If you had asked me about warp drive and I were a theoretical physicist 30 years ago, I would have told you, oh, you know, warp drive is a very nice plot device, but it can't ever happen in relativity, right? In relativity, special relativity, you can say, okay, I'm over here, there's a star I wanna to get to, it's 40 light years away. What I can do in relativity is I can travel super close to the speed of light. So I can experience this effect of length contraction where for me and my spaceship, it feels like the distance shortens to this star the faster I go. So let's assume I can go so fast that I can make this 40 light year journey in just six months. I get there, I do my business, I turn around, six more months, come back home. I've traveled 80 light years and I've only aged a year. But back on Earth, you and everyone else back home has aged the one year I've aged plus 80 more years for that trip. Bad news, bad scene. So what that means is under the rules of special relativity, if you go far away and come back, everyone on Earth, everyone on Earth will be dead and gone by the time you return. Not a good scene, not ideal. What they have in Star Trek is they envision, well, somehow, because in general relativity, you can distort the fabric of space. So somehow they said, you're just gonna distort the fabric of space that you move in one location, you come out at the other location, and there you go. Now we had ideas like wormholes, but that's separate from warp drive. Wormholes are a different device where you imagine folding space and poking a hole to connect two disconnected points. So you come in out one way and in the other. And so you'll say, okay, that's how I do instantaneous travel. But in the mid 1990s, a theoretical astrophysicist named Miguel Alcubier made a solution, found a solution to Einstein's equations where he said, you know what, if you take a look at what you can do to space time, here's an application that's gonna give you something that works just like warp drive does. Imagine that you create a bubble around a certain area of space, mm -hmm. right? You can call it a warp bubble. What's going to happen is in the forward direction, space compresses. In the rear direction, space lengthens to compensate for that. So now if you take this whole bubble, including you, and you move it over the compressed space, 
all of a sudden you've traveled a much longer distance with respect to the outside observers than you would think you would travel just moving at your normal speed because you've compressed the space in front of you. So now imagine you're taking that same 40 light year journey. You turn on your Alcubi air drive, you compress the space in front of you, you go forward for six months, you turn off your warp drive, and there you are, you do your business, you cut, turn around, turn on your warp drive, come back home, six months, get there, you've aged a year, everyone back home has aged a year. This is a real solution to Einstein's general relativity. Now, there is an open question because just because you're a mathematical solution doesn't mean you're a physical solution, right? If I said to you, hey, what's the square root of four? You tell me two. And I tell you, are you sure? And you'd think, oh no, he's trying to trick me. And I am, because it could be two or it could be minus two. The only way you know is mathematically both solutions are admissible. You have to look at physics to know which of those answers apply to your universe. Well, the Alcubier drive can exist, but only if there's a type of negative mass or negative energy in the universe. We haven't found one yet, but these are things we're exploring. In fact, there's an experiment going on over at CERN called the Alpha Experiment, where they are creating neutral atoms of anti-hydrogen. Nice, right? You get right. a proton and an electron, that's hydrogen. You make an anti-proton and a positron, bind them together, you get an atom of anti-hydrogen. If you take a hydrogen atom and you drop it in a gravitational field, it falls down, accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. What does antimatter do? Does it fall down at 9.8 meters per second squared? It should, that's what we expect. But because we haven't measured it, perhaps it falls up at 9.8 meters per second squared. Perhaps antimatter has anti-gravity. I don't believe it and I don't expect it, but you have to do the experiment if you want to know for sure. If it does, all of a sudden artificial gravity becomes possible, warp drive becomes possible, and all sorts of things you can imagine that require negative mass, you can make that real. Yeah, and, and, and so that leads me into, okay, so talking about negative mass, because I'm, I'm gonna go into this, because I saw recently you had actually written about this, um, and on, on, on your blog, it, it said uh, about Stephen Hawking's work or his, his mm -hmm. recent um, paper and how people are ripping that apart. Well, I, I think what, what happens, to be honest with everyone, I think what happens is when you become a celebrity or a public figure, uh, people start to fawn all over you and they start to sort of think everything you do is brilliant and miraculous. And this happened to Einstein too. Towards the end of Einstein's life, um, he published a whole slew of papers in the 30s and 40s and 50s up until his death that um, if anyone else had published them, people would have said, this is worthless, this is useless, this is some guy off in crackpot land doing crackpot stuff. Um, but because it had Einstein's name attached, everything he published got a huge amount of publicity and people expected that it would be this huge breakthrough. I think that started to happen with Hawking too, although I don't think he veered into crackpot territory. He was looking at very esoteric problems and he was looking at very specific, small aspects of those problems, and they were being touted, and he was touting them also, but they were being touted as, this is the next big breakthrough. Hawking made a bunch of big breakthroughs in the physics of black holes, in the quantum vacuum, in understanding singularities, and most of this work was done in the 60s and 70s, with some of it done in the 80s. Everything he's done after that has not been a big breakthrough, has not been groundbreaking. And his most recent paper, his last paper, uh, was one example of that, that it was 
it was not it doesn't deserve to be torn apart but it also doesn't deserve to be super lauded and fawned over it's it's another paper focusing on a very small aspect of the science of cosmic inflation so so what do you think about um okay so you mentioned inflation what do you think a lot of people ask me what i think about string theory what do you think about string theory uh, string theory is a great example of a mathematical theory that has some very intricate general properties that are worth exploring and that may be relevant to our physical universe. But as far as having experimental or observational evidence in support of string theory, we, we don't have any of it yet. So I think string theory is a nice example of a very powerful and potentially very physically interesting mathematical theory, but it hasn't yet written, risen to the point of being a physical theory yet. It's, it's something that, that is worth exploring further and is worth keeping an open mind about. Uh, but I don't think it's worth saying like string theory is just as solid as like the Big Bang. Like, no, the Big Bang has huge cornerstones of observational evidence. It makes predictions that we can go out and observe the universe and see if those predictions are validated or refuted. String theory doesn't have anything like that right now. So I think it's an idea that still, you know, even though people have been working very hard on it and very smart people have been working very hard on it for a long time, it's still an idea that is in its infancy as far as making predictions about the physical universe. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just feeling questions from the chat. Uh, let's see, uh, that, that are kind of going in line with this. Uh, and Snarky, I'll definitely ask him about the in-body, but I want him to explain what the in-body problem is um, before describing how it would affect dark matter, theoretically. Oh, so... Um, we have to start with the in-body problem is, first. This so. is, I assume, a question about the in-body problem in computational physics, not about Six and Lou's sci-fi book, The Three-Body Problem. I would, I would think the, the former, not the latter. <laughs> I've read the latter. It's very good, by the way. Um, so I would recommend when you think about gravity, right? If you have empty space with no mass in it, what does space look like? Well, it's flat space, real boring, real simple, easiest way to go. We have an exact solution to that in general relativity. We call it Minkowski space. Then you can say, okay, what happens if I put a mass down in my universe? Well, your equations get enormously more complicated, but you can solve them. You put one mass in the universe, and that solution is Schwarzschild space-time. So we do have a solution for that. And you can put a test particle in orbit in there and compute what happens. Brilliant. It's predictive. We know what happens over time. We can compute the solutions in relativity um, numerically as accurately as we want. Then you say, OK, now we're going to make the universe a little more complicated. I'm going to put one mass over here. I'm going to put a second mass over here. And now I want to know what happens to a test particle that I put down. Well, you're ruined. Okay, in general relativity, there are no exact solutions to this. You can only do approximate solutions and you can only solve them numerically. You can only do it with approximations because there is no exact solution. Relativity is very hard. This is different than in Newtonian gravity. If in Newton's gravity, I give you the positions the masses and the motions of all the particles in the universe, then if you had arbitrarily enough computational power, you can tell me how everything will evolve arbitrarily far into the future. In Einstein's gravity, those solutions don't exist. So in general, the N body problem is if n is three or more, if you have three or more masses that are gravitationally interacting or colliding or interacting in any sort of way under any physical force, you cannot make exact predictions. There are inherent 
uncertainties that just arise from the fact that you have multiple particles exerting forces simultaneously on one another. And the best you can do is make approximate calculations. If you've ever taken um, a double pendulum, right? This is where I have something fixed, I have a pendulum, and then attached to the bottom of the pendulum, I have another pendulum. If I take two double pendulums and I start them off with the same initial conditions, they'll evolve very similarly for a short while and then they'll diverge. That's an example of classical chaos. And this type of chaos shows up whenever you have more than two bodies in your system. Even in something like our solar system, where we say like, oh yeah, we've got the sun and the planets, and these eight planets are in these nice stable orbits moving around. Wait long enough. Wait, you know, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 25, 10 to the 27 years. <laughs> pretend that the sun doesn't die. Pretend that, pretend that, you know, all the catastrophes that are going to happen over enough time in the universe, like our star interacting gravitationally with other stars, pretend that doesn't happen. What happens if you just take our solar system, put it in isolation and let it evolve? Eventually, the other planets planets would spiral in towards the sun because they'd emit gravitational radiation, they would change their orbits, and gravitational interactions would possibly cause an ejection of one or more of these worlds. Multiple problems like this exist whenever you have more than two masses in your system. So that's in general what an n-body problem is. It's something that we can only solve numerically, and even then, there were some big uncertainties because a tiny change in your initial conditions can give you enormous changes in your final results. There you go. People are like, she doesn't look like she's interested. Got it. Guys, I have RBF, okay? It's, it, yeah, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have the male counterpart of that yeah, where I know. people look at me and they <laughs> see, uh, you know, I think the best way to say that is, uh, I don't want to fight you. <laughs> Uh, has he heard of cosmic superstrings from Ed Copeland? Uh, Ed, I don't, I don't work on the same things that Ed works on. Um, so there are two different types of strings that people talk about in general. String theory says that, okay, instead of particles, you have these tiny vibrating strings at different frequencies, and that is what is responsible for the different particles. That's the mathematical string theory we talked about before. There's also the idea of cosmic strings. This is, if you imagine what we could call a topological defect, right? If you have a shoelace and you tie a knot in one of your, in just your shoelace, and then you pull it out and you're like, I have this crappy knot in my shoelace, that's a topological defect. A knot is an example of a zero dimensional or a point like topological defect. No matter how hard you pull on that shoelace, you're not going to undo that knot. You'd have to untie the knot itself. Well, you can have topological defects that are in more than one dimension, more than zero dimensions. If you have a one dimensional topological defect, that's called a cosmic string. It represents a, a discontinuity, basically, in the properties of space at any one location. If you have a two dimensional topological defect, that's called a domain wall. Um, and that would be involved looking like one region of the universe was different from another region and there's this big barrier between them. So this is, these are examples of things that could have existed in the universe, but we've observed the universe really well and we don't see any evidence for the existence of cosmic strings or domain walls either today or left over from the early universe. So. What Ed Copeland works on is, is some uh, overlap between those two, where the strings from string theory or super string theory um, play a role in the large scale structure of the universe and cause cosmic strings to exist that are based on the strings from string theory. Uh, but like I said, if you want to know what's going on in the universe, you have to look to the universe itself. And so far, to very tight constraints, no evidence no evidence for cosmic strings there you go i think string okay people are talking so much about your mustache i'm trying to read and, and grab certain ones uh 
But I do want to make sure that there's other questions I've been asked all week. Yeah. So what have you been asked? What are people, what are people saying to you? Hey, Sky, what do you want to know? What, what can you tell me about? What do they want to know? Dark white, matter, white dark holes. energy, inflation, white holes. big bang, death of the universe. What are people asking you? White holes. White holes don't exist. Could exist, don't exist. Um, they're the theoretical counterpart to black holes. They're very interesting. Black holes absolutely exist. White holes, we don't see them. Some people ascribe to the idea that perhaps the Big Bang was a white hole. This is plausible. It would have to occur under very explicit conditions, and I don't want to get into the intricacies of that. But yes, white holes, with the exception of possibly the Big Bang, um, don't appear to exist in our universe. We see black holes and evidence for them, the counterpart of them, of something erupting in the universe. We don't see those. And and would you say the same thing with wormholes? I mean, as far as, you know, we, so Einstein predicted these were a, a possibility. <clears throat> would you still say that they don't exist? Or would you, does a theoretical physicist... Where do you come from, I guess, uh, from that? Like what uh, angle? From a theoretical viewpoint, I think it's very unlikely that wormholes exist in the universe. And I'll tell you the reason is because if you wanted to build a stable, traversable wormhole, what you would need to do is you would need to have an enormous, enormously mass black hole, an enormously mass white hole. You would have to quantum entangle them and separate them and then you could pass through from one to another this would be far bigger than any black hole even the most massive one we found in the universe it would be billions of times as massive as the most massive black hole we've ever discovered this is because you need tremendous curvatures to space-time in order to connect to disconnected locations. And we don't have that level of mass in one location anywhere in the universe. So that's why I think wormholes are unlikely to physically exist in our universe, because the amount of mass you would need in one location doesn't appear to be gathered in one location anywhere we look in this universe. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then the other things, I'm trying to think of the other things I got asked. I know people are asking me about questions that are just coming up now. Um, I saw some things in the chat window about intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. And I'm curious if you've been getting that all week. Oh, yeah. Yes. Confirmed. So what have you been what have you been getting asked about that? Well, uh, is there intelligent life? And then, of course, the Drake equation, which with the Drake equation, I take it is something interesting, but that in in already equals one. So in can never equal zero. That's what I take away from that. Um, but uh, intelligent life, the way I handle that is just kind of giving an idea of. You know, we have, we, we have a galaxy. It has anywhere between uh, 200 to 400 billion stars. We orbit one of those. Uh, that's just one galaxy. Um, and there's a lot. Um, and I'm not even showing what we do know is, you know, is cataloged on my screen right here. And this is very close in. So, That's right. So, yeah. So I, I, I say it's, it's very likely us finding it. That's a different story. But it's difficult to find. I mean, we're finding out that, that life is, is difficult. Planets are difficult. Well, so here's here's my take on this. Um, if you say, OK, we have 200 to 400 billion stars in the galaxy and maybe two trillion galaxies at latest estimate in the observable universe, uh, the part of it that's accessible to us since the Big Bang, mm -hmm. that's a lot of chances. That's about 10 to the 24 chances for stars to have planets with life on them. So, OK, of those stars, we now know we know how many there are. We know how many planets there are on average. Our solar system doesn't seem to be typical, but it seems to be typical enough where we can say around all of these stars, there are probably planets. At least 80 to 90 percent of stars ought to have planets. Many of them will have rocky planets or gas giants with rocky moons around them that are close to what we call the habitable zone, the zone where if you have an Earth-like atmosphere around your planet, 
you will have liquid water on your surface just from the temperature from the sun. So stars are common, planets are common, planets with Earth-like conditions are common, and Earth size, Earth mass, Earth radius planets are also common. Kepler has taught us this. So given all of those chances, I would say there were probably around 1 trillion, 10 to the 12 planets in our galaxy alone that could potentially have life on them. Now, in the Drake equation, there are three big steps you need to take for things to turn out right. One is you need to somehow make life from non-life. And that is something we have not been able to do in the laboratory. So we don't know if this is something that is a hard step or an easy step. My hope is that with the Europa Clipper mission launching in the 2020s, mm -hmm. we're gonna go to this moon in our solar system, the moon orbiting Jupiter with an icy surface and a subsurface water ocean. Just like we have life and the hydrothermal vents deep, deep down in the ocean where no sunlight penetrates, Jupiter's Europa, because of the enormous tidal forces that Jupiter exerts on it, the crust, the core inside cracks and heats up and we expect there to be eruptions. So on Europa, if you look at the surface, you can see these stars, these scars, these streaks running across the icy surface of it. And you can, and these are there because the ice is continually cracking and water from underneath it is upwelling. It's like a, uh, it's like a bigger, more massive version of Saturn's Enceladus, which has these huge water geysers that shoot 300 miles out into space. They don't do that on Europa because Europa is more massive and more gravitationally strong and also is made of more heavy elements than Enceladus is. So is there life in that ocean? Well, there's a chance and I want to find out. Is there life either past or present underneath the surface of Mars? Maybe. These are, these are interesting questions that we may discover if life is common, that there is more life in our solar system than what's initiated here on Earth. If it's rare, though, if that's a hard step, that might reduce the number of habit inhabited worlds from maybe a trillion. It could be much lower. It might be one in a million, one in a billion. Then you need that life to sustain on a planet like ours has. It took over three billion years just to evolve multicellularity. It took more than that to evolve gender. And you need gender if you have multicellularity because a single-celled organism can change and adapt and reproduce faster mm -hmm. than a multicellular organism. If the more complex and differentiated you are as an organism, the more time it takes to gather resources to survive and reproduce onto the next generation. So you need gender. You need at least two genders so that you can mix it up so that your offspring will have different mixed up genetic traits from what the previous one does. Evolution can happen much faster if you have mutation and sex than if you just have mutation. So that's what you need. And that's how you can arrive at something like the Cambrian explosion and these complex differentiated animals that we have, where it's not just animals, but it's plants and fungi. We have three different megafaunal kingdoms, right? or mega whatever you call them kingdoms, mega kingdoms I like, uh, multicellular complex differentiated. That we think is a hard step also, but we don't know how hard because we only have one example, planet Earth. And finally, then you need to take that leap where you recognize, you know, for half a billion years, we had complex differentiated life on Earth and only in the last few tens of thousands of years have we had an intelligent tool using species that became technologically advanced. So those three things all need to happen. And those are the three big unknowns that we're facing. I don't have the answers, but I can tell you if the question you're asking is, where is everybody? Well, why are you assuming that all of these three steps, all of them combined are common enough that we should have encountered another alien intelligence species by now? Yeah, I'm totally paying attention to him.
<laughs> Everybody's asking. I, I'm, I'm communicating with somebody else uh, that important things, but I can. He said, "Is the question you're asking like I, I'm listening, guys? I can multitask. I can read chat, listen to somebody, and talk." No, you're not. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> what about integrating? I life? don't feel disrespected to anyone in the chat window. I don't feel disrespected at all. So if you're reading something into that, we're all good here. <laughs> yeah, actually, my stomach's growling so so loud because I'm starving, and I was I was supposed to get a protein bar, but I didn't have a chance to get it. So. <laughs> well, you should have got a food replicator. I know, I know, and and so you I'm asking, I'm asking those. for help. They have, by the way, 3D <laughs> printers. On the International Space Station, they just recently 3D printed their first cooked pizza on the ISS. <laughs> and it works in zero gravity. Beat that, Star Trek. <laughs> My stomach's growling so hard right now it's so loud it's so loud and i'm like okay move the mic up like my, my stomach like i need food i need sustenance oh my gosh and, and then right there but you were going on but so yeah go on with what you're talking about though with your book like i was laughing because you just made that relevant to your book yeah you can i mean food 3D replicators. Printing, we don't have replicators but we do have if you add the right kind of feedstock to modern 3d printers go sneak a protein bar while i'm talking here no one no one's going to notice um, okay okay if you 3d print with the right feedstock plastic wood metal you can not only construct whatever it is you want to construct in real time and 3D to whatever accuracy you want to construct to the accuracy of your printer. They get things down to 20 nanometer accuracies right now. You can bind them together, but they also have 3D printers that are adapted to food. At this point, you can't just load them up with whatever atoms, molecules, etc., and say, okay, go ahead and print my edible whatever. You can't get your hot Earl Grey tea, but if you do start out with the right foodstuffs, you know, chocolate, or if in the case of a pizza, you want your dough and your cheese and your sauce and your stuff that you'll make your toppings out of, uh, a pepperoni puree or something, um, you can go ahead and 3D print that. And with enough heat, which is a tunable thing, you can actually 3D print it already cooked. And that's what they've done on the International Space Station. And that's what they do, you know, all over the world. You can 3D print pretty much whatever you want out of whatever you want. As long as you start with it, you can wind up with, as long as you start with the right ingredients, you can wind up with whatever you want to look at. All right. Uh, yes, there's no pineapple in space on the pizza. Uh, I don't think you can get that pulpy texture through a 3D printer. Um, I, people are asking about the beard. This is what you get when you're teaching an intro to astronomy class. You want to motivate your students. You had to shave your head because nature does not cooperate with your once long and curly hair. And you want to motivate them to write papers. What you do is I recommend that you challenge whoever writes the best paper as chosen by you gets to pick your facial hair and you will promise to grow it. And what they told me was, I want you to grow a goatee as wide as you like with a floating mustache. And it's evolved from there. I started growing this in 2009 when I was teaching at Lewis and Clark College, and I've never looked back. All right. I saw someone ask about the multiverse also, so I'll hold down the fort while Sky is gone. Let me tell you about the multiverse. People are like, oh, the multiverse, this isn't real. This isn't like, this isn't real science. Well, the thing is, just because you can't detect it or you haven't detected it yet doesn't mean it isn't real science. One of the things you do as a theoretical physicist is you say, okay, here are my best physical theories that describe the universe. What other predictions can I make with them? What other predictions can I tease out of them? Well, the first thing you can do is you can say, you know what? If I have the theory of cosmic inflation, that the universe is expanding exponentially, and this was a phase that happened before the hot big bang, then if I start with an inflating region, it grows and it grows and it grows. 
and different regions of it will have inflation end at different times. Why? Imagine you have a ball on top of a hill. The ball's going to roll down the hill. Now imagine you have the ball at the top of the hill, and there's no friction here, but the ball is very, very tenuously balanced. Okay, well, the ball's going to roll slow, 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 and then speed up and roll down the hill. Now imagine that this ball isn't an actual ball. Imagine it's a quantum field. So the ball is going to start to roll, but also because it's a quantum field, it's going to spread out over time, probabilistically. 50% of the time it'll spread out that way, 50% of the time it'll spread out the other way. What happens when you're up here and you start to roll and you have all these different regions you're creating? Well, in some regions, the ball's going to roll down the hill. And in some regions, the ball's going to roll down the hill even faster than it would. But in other regions, if the ball is rolling slowly enough, it's going to roll back up the hill towards equilibrium and keep you inflating for longer. It's going to delay when you get that hot big bang, when that energy turns into matter, antimatter, and radiation. So in some regions, you get big bangs right away. In other regions, space grows for longer and you get more big bangs in there. Well, it turns out if you actually run through the math of this theoretical physics for cosmic inflation and you apply the fact that you know this is a quantum field, what winds up happening? You get a whole slew of disconnected big bangs with inflating space between them, driving them apart. We know 13.8 billion years ago, inflation came to an end where we are. But we have every reason to assume from what we already know about the universe that there are many other regions that have had big bangs and they're all separated by this inflating space between them that should continue into the future for an eternity. If you do the probability calculations, you're far more likely to be in an inflating region than in one where inflation comes to an end. And I'm back, by the way. <laughs> Welcome back. I just talked a little bit about the multiverse. Good. That's that's another question I've been asked. That in parallel I universes. Might. I saw it in the chat window and thought I'd talk about it for a bit. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I and I actually I, I, I do have a question. Iceland. I know that's so not multiverse. I just Iceland is so cool. So I don't know how many of you have ever seen the Aurora Borealis or the Aurora Australis, if you've been to, uh, I guess, Antarctica is the best place to do that. If any of you have been to the ISS, then you've probably seen the greatest auroras of all. I never have. The thing is, next January, I'm leading an astro tour to Iceland. We'll be there for a week. It's an all-inclusive package. We're going to see geysers and natural hot springs and active volcanoes. We're going to be there for a total lunar eclipse that occurs just as the eclipse is ending. The sun's going to rise. So it should be a great thing. But we're going in January because we get 16 hours of darkness at night. And that's going to be the perfect time for not only spectacular views of the night sky, but to see aurorae. When you are close to the north or south magnetic pole, right, all the time solar wind particles and cosmic particles are coming out from the sun. These are charged ionic particles and the sun has a magnetic field and the earth has a magnetic field. And these particles travel along that magnetic connection and spiral down onto the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole of the earth. And they produce spectacular aurorae or in a giant ring, depending on how fast the particles are moving. There are a few places on Earth that are always, as long as you have darkness, that are always good for seeing aurorae. They are basically, if you're within about 30 degrees of the north or south magnetic pole. In the south, that means you want to be on the edge of the continent of Antarctica. That's the best place to be. In the north, there are huge swaths of northern Canada, Russia, the northern parts of Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and all of Greenland and Iceland are great places to go to view aurora. So next January, if you want to come and see 
an Astro Tour of Iceland with me. We have limited spots, but we do still have seats open. I'm delivering an Astro Tour of Iceland, and you can check it out at astrotours.co slash starts with a bang. If we can make a chatbot put that link in there, uh, we have separate prices for providing your own transportation or all inclusive from anywhere in the world they'll fly you over there. Um, and prices are very competitive. This is no more expensive than a standard tour run through any tour company. But the bonus is you get to do it with me and have access to some incredible night skies. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing those right now. <laughs> that looks good. Yeah. Most of them are green. That's oxygen. But oxygen. sometimes, as you can see, you get blues and reds. And those are other... Uh, atoms and molecules involving nitrogen and hydrogen transitions as well. Yep. And so everybody's like, that's awesome. I think I got the link right. I think we did. Uh, okay. And I think Fraser put it in here too. Fraser, didn't you? Seems like Fraser if did. Fraser, if Fraser put the link in, it's probably right. <laughs> well, I typed it in too. I hope I got it right. So you said it was astrotours.co slash starts with a bang and for those of you who don't know i write a column called starts with a bang it started as its own blog uh it now appears six days a week on forbes.com so i've made it folks yeah and we have all that information in a nice command but it's it's very it's compact and it goes away quick so um well People, people have a lot to say, and I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't blame them at all. Yeah. Maybe they find it just as interesting as we do. Look at this. We got 2,700 people here. Yeah, it's, I think a lot of people like these kind of questions. Some people are like, well, you know, it is, it is theoretical, and that's why I had you kind of expand on what, you know, theoretical physics does, um, because it is, a lot of it is, you know, just thoughts, but like, we need that too. There is a you know, what if this happens and this happens? What if there's this to explain this? Um, and and it's it's an important part and it's super cool. And everybody everybody is, um, the Astro Tours, what? Astro Tours are awesome. <laughs> Clearly, people that don't know that, you guys have not seen a dark sky at night because you have something really cool above your head and that's a band of the Milky Way. Just oh, one yeah, I can see it. It is looking fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. I would recommend if you've never seen it. And by the way, I didn't see it for the first time until I was in my 20s because I grew up in New York. I went to college in Chicago. My first job after that was in Houston. Didn't have good skies. But after that, uh oh, something's wrong with my mustache. Well, we better fix that. <laughs> Thank you, chat window. Um, so. What, what I did was I drove to the Grand Canyon, and the Grand Canyon at night was the first time I ever saw the Milky Way, and I was surprised at how bright it appears. The reason it appears so bright is because you need skies to be dark. If you have light polluted skies, you're not gonna be able to see things because the Earth's brightness on the sky is gonna be greater than the sky's brightness for what you can see. We have something called the Bortle Dark Sky Scale. And where you, if you live on the East Coast, it's impossible, right? Lower numbers are better. It's pretty much impossible to get a number lower than about a five on the Bortle Dark Sky Scale. And you really need about a three or a four to see the Milky Way. Out in the Grand Canyon, Bortle Dark Sky Scale number is two. You get clear skies there, beautiful. You can see about 4,000 stars and the entire Milky Way, including magnificent detail in it. So when we go take the Astro Tour of Iceland, we will be headed to some pretty pristine skies too. Even if we don't have an aurora, and if we do have clear skies, we probably will. But even if we don't, the views there are going to be out of this world. Yeah, and uh, let's see, someone had a good question. Oh, well, oh, so what about gravity? I don't know how much time. I don't want to go. I know you're you're almost 15 minutes over. I don't know how much time you have. I I know that we have uh, another guest coming on, but if you have another 15, that'd be okay. If I just don't want to be disrespectful. Well, I'm glad you got some food in you. I'm next, but I can <laughs> hang out for another 10 or 15. Okay. Let's do let's do three more questions Sounds you good. pick. Okay, so, well, someone just said something about gravity waves, gravitational waves. Um, I actually learned there's a difference between gravity and gravitational waves. Um, are they really found? Yes, 
I can answer, but I can answer that. Like, well, what's the question? Okay, so what about gravity <laughs> waves? Are they really found? Uh, what does that mean to all theory? So I can't a answer the end of that, though. Okay, so gravitational waves were a prediction that come right out of general relativity. Basically, this is an analogy with electromagnetism. If you have a charged particle that moves in a magnetic field, that magnetic field is going to cause that charged particle to curve. But what just happened here? All of a sudden, we changed the motion of our particle. When you change the motion of a particle, you change the momentum of the particle. You don't just need to conserve energy in this universe, you also need to conserve momentum. So when you have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, you have to emit some sort of radiation. In the case of electromagnetism, that's light. We call this synchrotron radiation or cyclotron radiation, depending on the, the frequency. And this is why, um, if you know about the LHC, the LHC takes protons and accelerates them very close to the speed of light. It used to take electrons and positrons in the same tunnel and accelerate them close to the speed of light and smack them together. It was called LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider, and they shut it down. And the reason they shut it down is because they couldn't get it to high enough energies to see what they wanted to see. And the reason they couldn't is because the electron is about 2,000 times less massive than the proton. So if you accelerate an electron versus a proton in the same magnetic field, the electron, because it has such a lower mass, because it has a higher charge to mass ratio, the electron's going to emit more of this synchrotron radiation. So now let's come over to gravity. Gravity is, well, we have a charge, we call it mass, and we have a gravitational field, we call it the curvature of space-time. So we've got two black holes, and they orbit each other, and these are some of the strongest gravitational systems you can have. When something moves and accelerates and changes its motion in curved space, in order to conserve energy and momentum, you have to radiate something away. And that's got to be gravitational radiation. This was predicted by Einstein's equations. People worked out more details throughout history of science, including Feynman, who was the first to prove by an argument like the one I just gave you, that gravitational waves must be physical and must carry energy away. We've witnessed binary pulsars. We've seen the orbits decay. So we knew they had to that this gravitational radiation had to exist indirectly. And then finally, most recently with advanced LIGO and now the Virgo detector, we've been able to detect gravitational waves six independent times from in spiraling and merging black holes and neutron stars. So yes, we are certain that even though the magnitude of these is incredibly small, gravitational waves are real, they exist, and they've been robustly detected. There you go. Yeah, and we and we thought that they, this would be a little bit more novel, I believe. We didn't think that we would just have these coming in like that. Um, you know, we this is a new type of astronomy. Yeah. I, I think this has not been emphasized enough. I know. Imagine what it would have been like if you lived on a world that was covered in clouds all the time. And then once, for the first time ever, you found a technology where you made a break in the clouds and you could see a star or a planet for the first time. You would say, oh my God, there's a whole universe out there to explore. Well... We've only ever seen the universe in electromagnetic signals, in different forms of light. Now, with gravitational waves, we have a whole new way to do it. We call this multi-messenger astronomy because we have the electromagnetic signals and we have the gravitational wave signals. And as we get better at this, and if we ever launch something like LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, that the European Space Agency, with some help from NASA, is going to design and build, we can actually look out at things like massive black holes, not like these rinky-dink stellar mass ones that right. we've seen so far, but the enormous ones at the centers of galaxies. And we can predict 
you know, in two years and one month and three weeks and two days and two hours and 27 minutes and six seconds, we're going to get a black hole merger and all the different types of telescopes can know exactly where and when to look to observe a catastrophic or cataclysmic event like this as it happens. Gravitational waves are literally going to give us a way to see the future before it gets here. <laughs> And that's, I love it. Everybody, everybody's loving it. Like, why aren't you our teacher? Why didn't we have you as a teacher in high school? That's, that's... Oh, I taught high school. It wasn't for me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it wasn't for me. And so my, my next question, I think this is um, a two part, so we can count this as the, the third and the second. So We'll see uh, the, how long it takes. Right. Well, look, as I think it, it goes. So what did uh, Stephen Hawking, even though I've covered it, but I want to hear you, what did he teach us? about black holes his biggest contribution right back in the day when people were ju just using general relativity they thought black holes static objects you can have a mass you can have a charge and you can have an angular momentum or a spin and that's it black holes have these properties they're fixed they're static around this time people were asking questions about it like hang on well, if black holes have those static properties, then something's weird, right? Because if I made a black hole out of a whole bunch of hot gas or a whole bunch of cold gas at absolute zero, then you're telling me I should get the same black hole out of them. But that can't be right, because then what about the second law of thermodynamics? What about that law that says entropy is always increasing? You're telling me that I could start with something with zero entropy, or I could start with something of enormous entropy, and all of a sudden they'd be the same? Like, mm -hmm. if I collapse them both into black holes, they'd be the same? That can't be right. So a guy named John Wheeler before Hawking. John Wheeler, by the way, was Richard Feynman's advisor, and uh, he was one of the people who was really instrumental in a lot of things. He was Kip Thorne's advisor, um, and he wrote a lot of great books and papers about quantum field theory and black holes and gravitation. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, here's the thing, when something falls in, it's possible that um, the entropy gets encoded on the event horizon, on the surface area of a black hole. So that was a nice idea. And then other people had come along like Jacob Beckenstein and said, well, hang on, if something has an entropy, then it has a temperature, right? right? If something has a non-zero entropy, it has a temperature. And if you have a temperature, you should radiate. And this is where Hawking's biggest contribution came in. Hawking was a respected scientist who had worked on black holes, singularities, um, and the physics of space-time. And he heard about this problem, and he said, oh, this is nuts. I'm going to prove that this can't be right. Black holes are black, and they shouldn't be radiating. So he said, here's how I'm going to calculate it. In flat, empty space, right, Minkowski space like we talked about, I'm going to calculate what the quantum vacuum does. And we don't know how to do that calculation exactly, um, but we do know how to do it relative to any other space. So he said, I'm going to calculate it in flat space, and then I'm going to take this space around a black hole outside the event horizon in Schwarzschild space. So he said, okay, now I've got this quantum vacuum and this quantum vacuum, and I'm going to take the difference, and I'm going to see what happens. And what he found was that actually, when you say what's going on in this space with a black hole versus this space without one, and you take the difference, you can see it looks like in all directions, there is this thermal black body radiation coming out of the black hole when you're far away from it. This is due to the difference in the quantum vacuum between the two space times. So as you get very far away and space becomes asymptotically flat, you don't get any more radiation. But it looks like when you're far away, you have this radiation coming from the black hole. It has a black body spectrum, which is the same spectrum you have if you look at, say, some red hot lava or the sun, like these are the colors that they are because you heat something up to a certain temperature and that's the light they emit. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, so this radiation is coming out of a black hole. This means they have a temperature, they radiate. We can detect this radiation. We haven't yet, but in principle we can. And it also means because if you're just made out of mass 
and you decay over time, you emit radiation, you've got to be losing that mass. E equals MC squared goes both ways. If you're emitting energy, that energy has to come from somewhere, and that only place it can come from is the mass of the black hole. So over time, black holes evaporate, and the smaller in mass you are, the faster you evaporate away. So black holes not only have an entropy, but they have a temperature and a lifetime. That was Hawking's big contribution. His other big contribution was the black hole information paradox, which he said, hold on. Now, I just said we had a way to like save entropy and black holes decay. But what's the difference? If I had a black hole that was full of entropy, had all this information encoded on its surface versus one that didn't have information encoded on its surface, According to his calculations, they should decay away in the exact same way. But you can't. Otherwise, again, you've lost information. So what's the solution to that? Well, the leading thought, and I say the leading thought because this hasn't been proven. The leading thought is that somehow the information that's imprinted on the event horizon of a black hole has to be encoded in the radiation that gets emitted away. People still argue over exactly how that happens and whether that happens, but that's the essence of the black hole information paradox. We aren't sure what the right answer is, but Hawking has conceded defeat that his initial idea that information wouldn't be conserved is likely wrong. Yeah, and I think you, you actually went right into what I was going to ask you. Do you want to do you want to end, though, with with what happens when you fall into a black hole? What yeah. would happen? Uh, if you fall into a black hole, uh, some terrible things happen to you, um, but not immediately. The bigger a black hole you fall into, the longer you'll have before you get torn apart when you cross that event horizon. If you want to maximize your survival time, what you should do is you should try and get on the path you would be on if you fell in from rest. If you fall into a black hole from rest, there's an ideal path you take. That's the maximum time you can survive when you fall into a black hole. What you'll see is as you get closer to it, there'll be this black disk that fills up your horizon. It'll distort the light around you. Eventually, as you come inside, all the light in the universe will appear behind you. It'll come in behind you, so look back so you can see it. It will be gravitationally blue shifted, which means it gets shifted to shorter and shorter wavelengths. As long as you still have working eyes, you'll be able to see the universe start to cons uh, converge to a single blue point behind you. And finally, What's going to happen to you physically is you will get what's called spaghettified, which is to say in the direction of the singularity, you get stretched and in all other directions, you get compressed so that you become like a long, thin strand of spaghetti. Eventually, the very atoms holding your body together will get torn apart and then, bam, you hit the singularity and that's the end. There you go. <laughs> that's amazing right. yep yep i think that's great and guys you can find him all over the interwebs everywhere i am all over the interwebs i'm on twitter at starts with a bang i'm on tumblr at starts with a bang i have a facebook page named wait for it starts with a bang that was not an aaron burr <laughs> reference but it should be now and then um you can find me on my blog, Starts With a Bang, on Forbes, six days a week. I have a Patreon. I have a SoundCloud where I do monthly podcasts. And, of course, I'm doing my Astro Tour in January in Iceland. And you can pick up my books. Technology is my most recent. And for you space buffs out there, my first book, Beyond the Galaxy, is still available. It tells the story of the entire universe's history and how we know what we know with no equations and lots of pictures. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate it. And so much knowledge, everybody here, um, you know, without the trolls, really appreciate it. And, and awesome to have you here. I hope to have you back. So thank you so much, Dr. Ethan. Thank you, Sky. It was my pleasure. And I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Take care. All right. You too. Bye bye. Bye.